Please join me in welcoming the amazing Dr. Rice on stage for what I promise is going to be quite the conversation. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Good uh, morning. Good morning. Th thank everyone. you for the music, uh, the sound. Uh, congratulations to the sound team that yeah. put together some music. Uh, look, years of public service, right? Um, uh, the board of a leading AI company, because AI is all in the news. You know, nobody cared about AI until a few months ago, and they started playing with ChatGPT. Right. But but you've been on Tom Siebel's board, uh, 2009 maybe, right. Some, right. So, something I like, right? Yeah. right. Yes. Um, Hoover Institution, concert pianist. By the way, concert pianist, you were featured in Steinway Magazine not too long ago. <laughs> Most people don't get Steinway Magazine, but right. if you do, yeah. <laughs> she's featured in Steinway Magazine of all places. Who is Condoleezza Rice? Well, first of all, it's because I bought a piano. Let's be very clear from <laughs> Steinway Magazine. Well, I bought um, one. They yes. didn't put me in the magazine, okay? Let's be clear. Well, let's see. I do love being a professor, and I always think of my first and most important vocation as professor. I come from a family of educators. My mom was a teacher. My dad was a high school guidance counselor, Presbyterian minister, football coach, and later on university administrator, so kind of grew up in that world. Um, I also am... Uh, I love music, as you said. I've been a, I was a, a failed piano major. I actually went to college to be a piano performance major. Uh, then went to the Aspen Music Festival School and learned what really good pianists could do and decided I need a plan B. <laughs> and so uh, changed my major. Uh, I am, as was said, a sports fan. I will watch just about anything uh, with a score at the end, uh, but I am uh, especially a huge fan of football these days, the Denver Broncos. I'm a small minority owner in the Denver Broncos. And yes, I am a Sharks fan. Uh, where are you? Huge Sharks Dan, fan. Dan yeah. right over here, the, the announcer for the Sharks. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. Because I, I, I grew up, I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, but I moved to Denver, my parents and I did, when I was 12. And uh, the University of Denver did not have a football team, but it had a national championship hockey team. And um, I would rather watch hockey than almost anything other than perhaps football. Fabulous, yeah. fabulous. So that's, that's a little bit about me. Well, it's, it's great because yeah. um, one thing about these interviews is you tend to learn a lot more. Of yeah. The, the, yeah. And, and you find out that people are, in the end, all just people. We're all that, just, that's right. we have our and, fun things that we love. And there are things that are important to you. You know, I think um, growing up in Birmingham, um, as I did, there was really, in that little community, you have your pledges. Ours was faith, family, and education. And so as long as you were faithful, and I grew up religious, I still am, as long as you cared about family, um, and as long as you got an education, which nobody could ever take away from you, was the way that it was put, uh, you could do just about anything. I'm going to clap for that, because that is very aligned with scouting. Uh, so what gets you excited every morning when you get out of bed? Well, first of all, I get out of bed really early. So um, What's really early? Five o'clock. Okay. Yes, uh, because I was a competitive figure skater. You were on the ice really early, so I now between now, piano and, and uh, right, yeah, it's, a little... it's a lot to do. <laughs> and um, so uh, this morning I was at my trainer at 5:15 before coming here. So I love the early morning. But what gets me excited is that I'm I'm one of the lucky people who gets to do something for my quote unquote work that I would gladly do if you didn't pay me a penny. I love to teach. I love ideas uh, at the Hoover Institution where I'm the director. Uh, I bring together, I get to be with all of these great scholars on everything from K-12 education to foreign policy to technology. And uh, we get to try and come up with well-designed answers to some of the country's biggest political problems. And so uh, that for me is really exciting in the morning. Uh, I get to be in a university with young people. Um, and I do think it, it's true, they are a little bit different than when we were young people. Uh, but they're amazing. They're the most high-minded generation I've taught in more than 30 years.
And so um, I, that excites me. And then just getting up every day and seeing what in the world is going to happen today. Um, I actually, and now that I don't really have to do anything about it, I'm not secretary anymore, uh, I can get excited about it instead. So what's the morning routine look like? You, you get out of bed at 5. I get up at 5. I work out uh, every morning. Um, I then uh, read the newspapers and so forth. And I do not take newspapers. I read online. Uh, so, and I have for 10, 12 years. So I read a source, several newspapers. Uh, people ask me, you know, how do you get your news in a day when news seems so slanted? And I always say, read as many different opinions as you can. I have a little ritual that I do, which is that I read at least one column of somebody who's going to make me really mad because I'm going to disagree with them. Because we all have a tendency these days to go into our little echo chamber and only read or talk to people who think like we do. So I go out of my way to read, about, read somebody who doesn't agree. Uh, I'm usually at work at about 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And um, my day is just kind of a blur uh, from then. If I'm fortunate, I'll get home uh, in time to practice the piano uh, for an hour or so. And then often, because of my job as director, there's something in the evening. Um, I try on uh, weekends um, to, um, I, I'm finally going to church again. What do I mean by that? I was online, along with everybody else. And then I got lazy about it, you know? It was really easy to get up in your pajamas and go to church. So I'm trying to get back to making it in person. And then I try to play golf on Sundays. So that's my week. That's, a, that's a, a quite, quite the week. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, you mentioned um, um, reading other opinions, and, and, and um, I, I've said this to people, because people, get, uh, we're going to talk about social media in a second, yeah. people, people get down this uh, rat hole today, and it's a constant feedback mechanism, and, um, and we start reading and seeing only the things that yes. we already click on and read. Yes. You cannot form a rational argument with whoever your competitor is, whoever's on the other side, unless you read what they're thinking. That's right. So go read the other stuff. And by the way, half the time you go, you know, that isn't actually a bad thought. That's, right. That's it's not right. how I would have come at it, but I, I, I can see why you're thinking that That's way, right. right? And so you actually have to, uh, you know, read the New York Times, read the Wall Street Journal. Right. I'm being a little facetious, right. but you get the point, no, right? No, that, that's just, just take about both right. Of them. Read the New York Times, yes. read the Wall Street Journal. Wall Street Journal, you've probably got exactly. both, bo both sides. Yeah. So, so you work with kids, you work with young adults. <clears throat> social media, one thing we did not have when we were growing up is social media that is literally scoring kids in high school and college yeah. as to popularity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and that's leading to teen suicides yes. and just horrific right. things. Yes. Tell me your feelings about social media. Well, it's, it's both good and bad, obviously. It's connectivity. But I remember the first time that I heard, I'm going to friend somebody. And I thought, well, that's kind of an odd concept. I thought your friends were people you actually knew. <laughs> and so from the, the beginning, it seemed to me uh, to be something that could be alienating, if you will. And I think we see that for some kids it is. Come on, you know, not all of us were popular in high school. Uh, but nobody knew it. If you're not popular in high school today, millions of people can know it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it puts a lot of pressure on the kids. Uh, but we're not going to take it away from them. The, the fact is they were born with those little things in their hand. Uh, they cannot be separated for their, from their phones for more than a few minutes without some anxiety. And so I think we have to teach them how to learn to manage this. Mm -hmm. And I have friends who say, I tell my kids, you know, you're just not going to have the phone with you during dinner or doing this or doing that. I think activity is really important. One reason I think scouting can, can play a role or, or organize sports is uh, you actually can't be on your phone while you're not doing when you're those, climbing a rope. Not when you're climbing a rope. <laughs> we need all our hands for something right, else. Or not when you're figure skating or not when you're golfing and so uh, or not when you're playing an instrument. And so I think one answer is to get them active and uh, kind of off the sofa. Uh, the other thing is that um, I tell my kids uh, and remember I now have older, you know, my, my students are 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, and one of the things that I do is I actually recruit for Stanford Athletics. So I was doing a recruiting session for the football team a few uh, days ago. 
and I said to them, you know, there's all this stuff about name, image, and likeness, right? And you've heard of it, NIL, and they get to benefit from their name, image, and likeness. I said, but remember, your name, image, and likeness is for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Whatever you sign on today is going to follow you forever. And so helping them to understand that that's the way social media is, that what they do on social media has to protect their reputation today, I think is also a way to help them. And then finally, um, on the point of, of hearing people who think differently, I, I just tell my kids flat out two things. Uh, first of all, you do not have a constitutional right not to be offended. Nobody wrote that into the Constitution. So um, if, you, if you're offended, before you organize the university on White Plaza to protest because you were offended, why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, you know, that was offensive. Now we can have a conversation about what that was. And if they meant to offend, you've called them out. But more likely, they kind of didn't know. And then when you offend, uh, others will give you a break. So let's try to level the playing field a little bit. But everybody gets respect and we can talk things out. The second thing that I tell them is, uh, if you find yourself constantly in the company of people who say amen to everything you say, find other company. <laughs> because you will not, as you said, you'll never develop the ability to sustain an argument. I, I taught a course for the last uh, several years. I'm not teaching right now, but it was a, considered a very difficult course. They read 500 pages a week. They wrote a five-page paper every week. I read 25 five-page papers every week. And we had a three-hour session every week in class. Now, one reason that I had them write a five-page paper every week, and this is something we have to be very uh, cognizant of with you, is that uh, they can't sustain an argument. They can't write. I don't mean they can't make subject and verb agree. They can do that. But I used to say to them, uh, did you just intend to kind of start this and wander to the end and hope for the best? I said, you know, we used to do something called an outline mm -hmm. when I was in college, <laughs> in high school. And so there's a beginning, it, there's a there's beginning, a middle, there's, there's an, an end, there's argument, the point is there, there's yeah. a, and they have to learn to do that also in oral argumentation. And if it's mm. just, well, I feel like, which I do not allow in my class, I feel like, I don't care what you feel. I really want to know what can you understand? What can you demonstrate? What evidence do you have? And then you have to be able to take your argument and, and go at somebody who thinks differently and make a rational argument. And so civility of argumentation, the ability to listen to people who, with whom you disagree, even if it's really hard, uh, we have this thing these days that we talk about harmful language. I just hate that term. Because you're going to run into people who are jerks from time to time. And you have to learn how to handle that too. You know, in my family, um, we had my parents, I grew up in a little segregated uh, part of Birmingham. I think everybody in uh, that neighborhood taught school. See, it's ever, there's one doctor, one lawyer, everybody else taught school. And uh, they would say, uh, you have to be twice as good. Now remember, this is segregated Birmingham. And they meant, if you're going to succeed, you're going to have to prove yourself twice over because of prejudice and so forth. So they didn't say, it's a shame you're going to have to be twice as good. It's unfair you're going to have to. They just said, you have to be twice as good. So we went around trying to be twice as good. Now we work twice as hard. Now we're twice as confident. And that little community produced an amazing array of successful professionals. Then they said, there are no victims. Uh, the minute you tell yourself you're a victim, you are giving control of your life to somebody else. You may not be able to control your circumstances. You can control your response to your circumstances. And so they, I say always, ironically, I'm grateful that I grew up in segregated Birmingham because I learned important lessons that I think have taken me through life. For, for sure. Um, Hani, you, you touched on this a little bit, but this has happened at Stanford. Two, two things. One, you know, the long list of verboten words that oh, you're yeah. not allowed to use. I, I read that list, and, and at some point I said, I, if I was teaching there, yeah. I would not 
I, I failed. I, I should yeah. just quit. I, yeah. I can't even remember, you know, there was page after page yeah. after page yeah. of someone in HR yeah. that said, you can no longer right. use this right. because you might offend someone, right. so therefore you have to use this. Right. And I understand, clearly there's some words in the English language that are highly offensive. We get right. that. And there's, that's 10 or 20. But this was hundreds. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. impossible to teach yeah. that way. No, and nobody does. I mean, the, the <laughs> fact is, it, it was actually the IT department that put it together. <laughs> oh, and those and, are the people who yeah, know. Yeah, right. And, um, <laughs> because they are the most offensive. Right, right? yeah. But, 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 sa but so, sorry, IT professionals. Yes, yeah. Least offensive. <laughs> but fortunately, fortunately, the university backed off of it right away. OK, yeah. they said, this is not official <laughs> policy. I actually thought it was a joke when I saw it. Uh, and then they told we know it's not a joke, and so the university backed off of it. And again, I don't want to offend the IT people, but probably the best line was from the students with the Stanford Review who said, yes, the IT department has spent all of this time making uh, a harmful uh, word list, uh, but they can't deploy a usable uh, search engine for right. admissions, right? right? So right. It, it kind of became, uh, and so nobody actually believes that we should do that. <clears throat> but it does say something about the, the kind of mentality that, uh, and you know, things went on there like you can't say American. Well, you know, I was kind of the American Secretary of State. People <laughs> right. understood that. I think I might and, use yeah. the term American. And, yeah. How did that become offensive? Well, well the, it could be offensive idea, to some people. Yeah, right? the idea was America is bigger than the United States of America. I saw that, right? yeah. But I've never heard a Brazilian call themselves an American. Right. Or a Canadian call themselves an American. And so, uh, actually, American is an incredibly inclusive term. Because what are we saying? We're saying we come from all kinds of ethnic backgrounds. Right. Our ancestors came from all kinds of nationalities. You can be Korean American. You can be Mexican American. You can be German American. But you're American so that it is a term that means there is no ethnic, national, or religious de definition of what it is to be American. So it's actually a wonderfully inclusive term. And I explained that to somebody, and they said, you know, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, we're doing something wrong if you haven't right. thought of that. Right. Yeah. You know, I'll, 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 along that thread, and then we'll get on to some world stuff, it uh -huh. is, is uh, um, and again, you sort of touched on this, and, but this happened at Stanford over the last year, is <clears throat> some organization on Stanford, as you know, <clears throat> at Stanford or Berkeley or Santa Cruz or whatever, says, hey, we're going to have all these speaker series, right? We're going to have a bunch of speakers on, and some of them are far left, and some of them are far right, and some of them are in the middle, and right. some of them have, uh, have some views that some people might say are uncomfortable for a particular race or whatever it is, right? And then the, the kids go and protest and demand that the, the president of the university yeah. step down because yeah. they allowed this speaker on yeah. campus. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea of college campus for as long as any yeah. of us remember was to have all these alternative ideas come and the students can learn. They can agree or disagree, but right. you can hear all these different ideas. And now they just demand that the president yeah. resigns yeah. every time there's a speaker on yeah. campus. How do you feel I, about well, that? Well, it's crazy. And actually, I think there's a backlash against it. Mm -hmm. I think the middle is taking control again. Mm -hmm. so so uh, when the uh, really awful incident happened at the Stanford Law School, right. uh, and we had a conservative judge, and you know nobody minded if students wanted to hold up signs or so forth, but they are not supposed to disrupt, and it was tremendously disrupted. Unfortunately, a an administrator got in the mix who didn't help things. But uh, the dean of the law school did something very very interesting. She is a First Amendment lawyer constitutional lawyer. And so she wrote a lengthy <clears throat> legal brief that basically said, you're in law school and you don't understand the First Amendment. Therefore, I'm going to explain it to you, to her law students. And oh, by the way, you're going to have a half day session on the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. right? Now, uh, that was actually really effective, I think. Yeah. So it isn't always just saying to them, you shouldn't act that way. It's sort of saying, all right, we're going to go back to basics. And uh, you have a right to protest, but you don't have a right to disrupt. And oh, by the way, you're about to be lawyers, and you aren't going to get to choose the judge from whom you to whom you go. And so you probably ought to learn to live with people who have differing views. Mm -hmm. And so I think these situations can be turned to the good. 
And uh, I'm involved through the Hoover Institution, which is center right in our orientation. We're not partisan, but we, uh, Herbert Hoover created us with, uh, as a part of Stanford University, but with three principles. He said the human condition can be improved by individual liberty, by limited government, and by private enterprise. And on the basis of those values, uh, we do research that takes us wherever it takes us. We don't cook the books in our research. But we are a part of Stanford, and I have never had more, uh, more requests to get Hoover Fellows involved in this and Hoover Fellows involved in that, because uh, uh, the president, particularly of, of Stanford um, and, and uh, the provost, recognize that uh, universities have gone too far the other way. So I think, I think there's room uh, to to win this back. It's it's unclear to me how in this country um, that somehow uh, uh, um, thinking about you know maybe government shouldn't be so big and maybe private industry actually works a lot of the time. How did that become right? Yeah, you know, yeah I know. That's it, what it just is. I mean, the, the whole country that, was built that way. That, it wasn't meant to be political. That's exactly what it was. It was a little bit like COVID wasn't really meant to be yeah, political. Yeah. It just is. It I just can't is. change it. These days, everything is. But, but we, as, and you know, actually at Hoover, we have people who are Democrats and Republicans. We're across the board. But those key values, I did say once in the faculty senate when they said something about limited government, I said, you know, I think that's the reserve powers clause of the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. So some of this is <laughs> it, just... It uh, is in the Constitution. Yeah, it is, it is, you know, the, <laughs> that all powers that are not reserved to the federal government are reserved to the states, states and to the that's people. Right. That's right. And so um, but some of it is we just have to get in and make the argument. And uh, I'm more than willing to make the argument. Quite effectively, I yeah, believe. <laughs> so, so if you had been here two or three years ago and I said, let's talk about world politics, we'd all go, there's nothing to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> However, in the last year and a half or so, there is a lot to talk yeah, about. And, um, and I'm going to open with, uh, with, with China. Um, uh, because uh, China has gone from what a great low-cost place to make things and we all buy them to um, and you know not making any opinions here just sort of the, the news right there there's they're they're stealing intellectual property they're using our intellectual property they've been doing so for a very long time as it turns out and um, and they really want to get Taiwan back in a more aggressive way than they've been and they've and they've closed their borders and they've gone and you know jailed people that we know I mean they've really really become sort of a communist country and I, I think uh, again they've been a communist country but they're really, yeah. really be acting that way and and I think uh, some wake up to many Americans was of course Russia and we'll talk about that in a minute but we've got these two big communist powerhouses and um, I've started telling people when people say well what do you think like I know I don't know but I go well maybe it's actually a bad idea to actually do business with communist countries <laughs> this doesn't end well it's going yeah. to end badly so yeah. let's start with China, China. you yeah. know what's going on and where do you think that ends well you're right about three years ago or so you know the, the re-emergence of let me just call it great power conflict mm -hmm. right for um, after the end of the Cold War it it looked like there was kind of only one model. It was ours, and uh, we were pretty, pretty dominant. And then, and even China, in after Deng Xiaoping decided to pull China out of isolation, China joined the international economy. Yeah. So that was the bet that you're talking about. Yeah. So the bet was, uh, you've got 1.4 billion people. They're very creative. They're very uh, industrious. Do you want to have them outside the system or inside the system? And people made a bet that if you integrated China, China into the international economy, then yes, they we had problems with intellectual property, yes, they didn't have open markets, uh, yes, they manipulated their currency, but over time that would change because as they became a more responsible partner in the international economy, which by the way, they were benefiting from greatly because they lifted 500 million people out of poverty right. by that right. relationship. They would the see the value they of this system. They would see the value and, and they would do what we and there was also a piece of it that people said you know you can't have economic liberalization and political control so I worked with Jiang Zemin. I worked with Hu Jintao. These were the prior presidents. And yeah, they were communists, but they kind of understood that they were benefiting from this system. And moreover, they didn't really want to raise their heads up in terms of Chinese power. They were doing something that Deng Xiaoping called bide and hide. So you're not that powerful. Bide your time, hide. 
Enter Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping has a completely different view of how China ought to operate in the international system. And effectively, he says, uh, if you give me a choice between economic liberalization and political control, thank you very much, I'll take political control. And that was an answer we weren't prepared for because we, everybody thought it was going to be economic liberalization. Now, it has some costs to China, and we have to recognize that. You probably are familiar, zero COVID basically stalled out the economy. They're still trying to find uh, ways to grow because of that. Uh, sometimes I hear uh, what I'll call authoritarian envy. Right? Oh, they build such great airports. Oh, their roads are so nice. Oh, we can't do anything in our democracies. Every time you hear somebody who has authoritarian envy, just say uh, the following to them. The one-child policy. The one-child policy instituted by the Chinese Communist Party some decades ago, 30, 40 years ago, and now 34 million Chinese men don't have mates. And now India has just surpassed China in terms of, uh, of, mm -hmm. of population. Yep. So they are making mistakes. And uh, we have to recognize that they're an adversary. That's how they see themselves. That's who they are. Uh, when it comes to their foreign policy, they engaged in something called wolf warrior diplomacy. Um, now that's, wolf warrior and diplomacy are not words you usually hear together. And so they did things like tell Australia, they were gum under the shoe of China. They went to a border with India and beat up Indian soldiers. The border had been closed for, uh, quiet for 40 years. Well, you know, this, this produced a backlash. And before you knew it, India, the United States, Japan, <coughs> and Australia had formed something called the Quad. Australia, Great Britain, and the United States had formed something called AUKUS. And countries from Vietnam and the Philippines were inviting the United States to have bases there. Mm -hmm. And somebody woke up in China and said, hmm, this is not exactly having the impact we had hoped. And so now Xi Jinping is on a charm offensive. <laughs> you may have seen that he went and made peace in the Middle East between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, my guess is it won't last, but that's all right. That's what he wanted to do. Now he's telling the United States, you know, I can, can probably help negotiate a peace between Ukraine <clears throat> and Russia. This is after having told the Russians that they were in a uh, relationship without limits. Now, I know how this conversation went. Took place, <laughs> took place at the, I mean, I don't really, but I can imagine. <laughs> took place at the Beijing Olympics, all right? So Putin, they, they signed the relationship without limits. You're right, they're both, uh, you know, the Russians aren't so much communists these days as they are really nationalist, right? This is about the Russian empire. But they're both dictators, and the West is weak, and uh, they looked at the way we pulled out of Afghanistan. They said, we don't keep our commitments. And so they sign their relationship without limits. And I suspect that Putin says to Xi Jinping, you know, I've got to do this thing in Ukraine. Uh, and it'll take four or five days. Uh, you understand, because you've got the Taiwan problem. And Xi Jinping says, fine, just don't do it until after the Olympics is over. Okay. And <clears throat> a year and two months later, Xi Jinping finds himself in bed with a homicidal maniac who is bringing sanctions down on everybody. And uh, as you know, I was a figure skater. All right, well, a figure skate is a quarter inch blade. The Chinese are on a quarter inch blade. On the one hand, they want the Russians to win, and they really don't want to see Putin lose. That would be good for us, the United States. So they want to help. But on the other hand, they don't want to do anything that would bring sanctions down on their economy. So when our administration wisely let it be known that we knew that they were considering arming the Russians, uh, they said, no, 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 we're not doing that. Because they know that if they were caught arming the Russians, you would have sanctions against the Chinese economy just like that. They need growth. They can't afford further sanctions. And so it's a challenge dealing with, uh, with the Chinese. You mentioned Taiwan. Um, I, they, you know, part of Xi Jinping's thing is that he uh, wants to end up next to Mao in the, uh, the kind of Chinese pantheon. Mm -hmm. He's already disposed of Xi, Zhang Zemin and, and Hu Jintao. Deng Xiaoping, he's passing by, and then he'll be next to Mao.
But in order to do that, he has to restore China. What does that mean? They've already restored Hong Kong. Hong Kong is just another province of China now. Mm -hmm. And now, what about Taiwan, which is the last missing piece? Um, you had Jim Mattis here uh, last year. I think military people will tell you that to try to invade Taiwan in an amphibious landing <clears throat> is kind of like D-Day on steroids. And probably the Chinese can't pull that off. But what they can do is they can bring all kinds of pressure on Taiwan. We saw in the exercises that they did at the time of Nancy Pelosi's ill-advised visit, uh, we saw the exercises looked like what uh, military people call denial exercises. In other words, a kind of blockade so mm -hmm. that they couldn't trade, cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. And what's the goal? The goal is to get a really pro-Beijing government in Taiwan. At the time that President Tsai was meeting with Kevin McCarthy in uh, California, the head of the opposition, or the, the former head of the opposition party, the KMT, was in Beijing. And so, uh, you know, you can imagine the KMT in the elections, which are in January, saying, you know, we can end all of this unpleasantness. And so I think the Chinese will play in the Taiwanese election. I think they'll use cyber attacks. I think they'll bring pressure. But um, an all-out invasion seems to me pretty foolhardy. Not that people don't do foolhardy things, but uh, it would be pretty tough. Interesting. Uh, let alone the assets that they want there, including TSMC, the largest TSMC, semiconductor the largest semiconductor in the world. Uh, yeah. in the world. And by the way, uh, they have the one, one of the salutary things about Ukraine is maybe Xi Jinping has learned two lessons. First of all, the West did get its act together. By West, I mean Japan and others mm -hmm. got its act together and brought sanctions, pretty tough sanctions on Russia. The second thing is maybe your army's not as good as you think they are. Certainly, uh, Vladimir Putin thought his army was good, and they're not. As a matter of fact, they're pretty awful. Well, that, that's a great segue to Russia and, and Ukraine. Um, when General Mattis was here uh, last year, he was quick to point out that he never felt that the Russian army was any good. It's a, it's, it's a railroad army. That's it right. gets its supplies on rail, yep. and you basically cut off their supplies, and they're in trouble. Yep. And, and actually, they mostly like to get drunk rather than fight in their conscripts, and they don't want to be there um, at, at all. I know that's probably not PC to yeah. say that the Russian yeah. army gets drunk, but nevertheless, it, it, they well, do. It happens to be true. It yeah. happens to be true. I read it in the yeah. New York Times. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Both sides say yeah. the Russians like to get drunk. Right. Uh, so, so look, I, 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 I want to know, what, what do you think was going on in, in Putin's head at the at that moment and we knew he was going to invade and yes. he certainly did and then you know where does that lead where is it now and where how does it end well I think he made three big miscalculations uh, one I mentioned that the West wouldn't do anything you know we had and Af Afghanistan caused us more credibility than anybody recognizes mm -hmm. because if you devote 20 years to a place and then you leave with people hanging off the ends of your transport planes you don't recover from that. So that, I think, was part of it. Secondly, um, he really did think his army was good. They had spent billions and billions of that. Their, their per performance in Georgia was awful. Um, they did have a lot of drunk soldiers. Uh, they basically ended up of kind of where they started in Georgia. And so since 2008, they had spent a lot of money trying to remake their armed forces. And uh, they even were trying experiments. So in 2006, uh, the then defense minister, Sergei Ivanov, asked Don Rumsfeld, he said, tell me about those sergeant majors, right? He said, those people seem important to your armed forces. They don't have NCOs. So they have uh, entitled, arrogant, corrupt officers and 18-year-old conscripts. And they have constant morale problems. They also don't move, as Jim said. Uh, they are an army that was never meant to go on the offensive, really. Uh, an army that can maneuver, maneuvers with trucks, not rail. Mm -hmm. And so Putin just miscalculated about his army. Most importantly, he misunderstood the Ukrainians. You know, uh, Russians, even liberal Russians, will make this mistake that oh, the Ukrainians are just kind of our Ukrainian brothers. They're just kind of Russians with an accent. 
There's a, a Tchaikovsky suite called the Little Russia Suite. It's about Ukraine. Right? So oh, there's a mentality that, of course, they're us. They will, they will welcome us because that group that's in Kiev, you know, they're just not. So the Russian army went to, their, went to the war with five days provisions and their dress uniforms for the parade in Kiev. So that's what they thought was going right. to happen. Right. Now, oops, oops, <laughs> didn't happen. And now they're changing their tactics. It's absolutely true they're a terrible army, but they bring two things. They bring mass. And I think Putin has decided time can be on his side. We'll get tired. The Ukrainians <clears throat> will get tired. But mass, he can just throw untrained Russian men at it. Who die. Who die. They're and just, they're just Putin cannon. Putin doesn't care. No, they're just cannon fodder. Right. And he'll engage in terrorist activities against Ukrainian civilians. So you've seen mm -hmm. apartment buildings, the grid, et cetera. So that, that's his battle plan. Couldn't they're they're very key. good at shooting little they're, old ladies, they're, but they're, not good, not much good else. At, at much else. And so they'll, they'll do what they're good at, throw a mass at it and engage in, in terrorist attacks. And so um, how does it end? I don't think either Ukraine or Russia are thinking about that just yet. Eventually, we will know more. Right now, they're in a period of time. Uh, the Russians have a great word for it. It's called smook. It's, it's not quite mud, not quite snow. It's something in between. Mm -hmm. uh, Hitler and, and uh, Napoleon both got mm -hmm. caught in it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, right now, nobody can move. Pretty soon, the Ukrainians may launch this long-expected uh, <coughs> counteroffensive. We'll sort of see in July, August, where everybody is. And I think at that point, people will start thinking, have the Ukrainians taken enough territory that they can rebuild a sustainable, independent Ukraine? What does that agreement look like? Is Putin tired of the fight? Um, that's, I think, where people are going. Because right now, uh, nobody, uh, neither side is ready to come to the table. When you look at the daily cost of the war, depending on wh whose source you look at, it's many, many billions of dollars right. for Russia. Yeah. You know, the Russian economy isn't that big. They may have spent one, one and a half, two trillion dollars. Right. You right. may have better numbers right. than I do, but right. numbers like that on this war, they don't have two trillion dollars. No. That's a ridiculous no. number. We could barely afford that. Right. They are an economy that is much, much, much smaller than us. That's right. But, uh, but at they, some point, don't they run out of money? No, they, because Russian suffering <laughs> is just part of the lore, you know? Uh, it, <laughs> it's good. It, it's, it's, it's right. And what they'll do is they're, they're actually, they're getting some money from selling discounted oil. Right, to places like India. Um, and so they'll keep doing that. It's not the full amount, but they will get some revenue there. Uh, they're actually doing a pretty effective job of, uh, of substitution of consumer goods. Uh, so there, you, know, you may not be able to buy uh, a really nice refrigerator that's a Western-made refrigerator, but the one that they made in Kazakhstan is kind of OK. And so you're seeing a lot of that. But the longer term, uh, 800,000 or so, maybe a million Russians have left. Because about 500,000. The, the smart ones. The smart ones. About yeah. 500,000 people left right when the war started. They were entrepreneurs. They were um, uh, the um, knowledge-based uh, workers. Uh, they were coders. They were software engineers. They got out. They were in Azerbaijan and Turkey and wherever they could get to. And then another 300 to 400,000 Russian men got out when they started the general mobilization. So the population is uh, down and down of its most uh, creative people. Uh, yeah. Secondly, Russian oil and gas, uh, which depended very much on Western technology to develop these very remote oil fields in places like Sakhalin mm -hmm. Island, uh, they won't be able to do that because they're, except for the majors, uh, Exxon, BP, uh, and others, <clears throat> nobody has that technology. So their, their production is going to be in the tank for a long time. But I think they'll just keep uh, suffering. Um, uh, Putin uh, is not, I think, fully being told the truth. Uh, he believes that sooner or later we will get tired. That's what he's waiting for. I think uh, he's going to wait a very long time. I think he's going to wait a long time, too. But I'll tell you, every time he hears uh, from the far left of the Democratic Party and from the far right of the Republican Party, uh, what are we doing in Ukraine? I can guarantee you 
that that's the clipping that they put on his desk. Mm -hmm. Because you don't like to give Putin bad news. <laughs> so you find the good news. Because you get thrown out the window every single yeah. time. Yeah, well, you're just clumsy, and you fall out the <clears throat> window. Yes, you fall out the window. There have been Amazing. several, several, every single time. several of those really, really clumsy oligarchs who just keep falling out of hospital windows. It's really amazing. Uh, I'm going to ask you one last uh, uh, world question uh, before we wrap, uh, which is uh, Iran. Uh, a lot of, uh, not everybody is aware of this, but uh, Iran has... Uh, has uh, been able to uh, um, perhaps enrich uranium now to uranium to uh, levels that are usable in nuclear weapons. They uh, keep saying they're not making nuclear weapons. We know they are. Yeah. That is what they're doing. Uh, what are your what's your one minute thought on you know yeah. what happens? How do us and the Israelis and maybe yeah, others deal I, with that? Because I don't think we can accept a nuclear well, it was terrorist a, organization. It, we made a mistake in signing the agreement. That's uh, <clears throat> water under the bridge. But look, there are three elements of a, of a nuclear uh, capability. There's a, you have to have a delivery system. Mm -hmm. You have to have a bomb design. You have to have fuel. Yep. We know they've got kind of, we believe they've got all Pieces three. Pieces of them, yeah. But probably haven't married them. And if they're smart, they won't because as long as they're kind of latent in their capability, uh, people might tolerate it. The minute it looks like they're trying to make that capability operational in any way, somebody will take care of it. And it probably won't have to be us. Let me just put well, it that way. Yeah, I, I, I have a feeling there's some people very close <laughs> yeah, by who right, right. may need some refueling yes, from us, but right. other than other that, than they, that can, yeah. they can take it themselves. Yeah. Um, so uh, scouting prepares young people for high integrity leadership. Um, just give me your sort of 30 seconds on why scouting is important to, to deliver the leaders of the future. Well, it's important because uh, you don't just declare them leaders. You actually give them a pathway to leadership. I can't tell you how many kids come into me and they say, I want to be a leader. And I say, that's not a job description. And it's not a destination. All right. So <laughs> let's talk about how one gets there. You get there through uh, exercising it, through helping your your fellow scouts or your fellow students or whatever to organize themselves. You have to learn leadership characteristics. And I think scouting is really built on learning leadership characteristics, not just declaring somebody leaders. I think it was Jane, if I got her name right, who said something I always say about leadership, which is leadership is not you leading. It is seeing leadership characteristics in others and enabling a team to lead. And that's what the best leaders do. And I think that's what you do in scouting. Finally, please join me in thanking Dr. Condoleezza Rice thank you, today. Great. Great, job. great job. Thank, thank, you, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.